Arctic Explorations. I'm going to share in 18 minutes some of the things I've been doing with great pleasure and also some of the things I've been seeing for some uh, time and also the things I am foreseeing if it comes to the future of the Arctic. And that's happening in 18 minutes. Actually, uh, I wasn't quite sure about the first uh, opening slide. This picture is very fresh, taken only four days ago in Greenland. I was there to prepare for a new mission. But uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why I like going to the Arctic. Uh, this is Northern Light, for those who don't recognize it. It's uh, one of the most beautiful regions on the planet. And the region that inspired me to go there to uh, seek the adventure, explore, and ultimately also try to protect it by giving a platform to the Arctic to the wider audience. Um, it really started off with my earlier expedition, as just mentioned, I did indeed ski to the geographic North Pole from the Canadian uh, mainland in uh, 97 with a Dutch team. Uh, Welke Verrooyen, the, uh, the guy from Utrecht uh, back then, he also joined me to the geographic South Pole, which is completely different territory. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about the Arctic region, but uh, the Antarctic, where we ski to the South Pole, is... Uh, it's uh, a huge continent covered by uh, land ice. We covered uh, yeah, quite a distance, almost 2,300 kilometers in uh, 68 days. Uh, we partly did it by using uh, the wind energy on the continent and using big kites to propel ourselves. I don't have too much time to talk about that. I'm going to focus on my Arctic experiences, which uh, started indeed during my studies uh, at the University of Delft really interesting time. I was ready to become an architect. I even had an offer to start a bureau with the funding of one of my professors, so that was looking great. But I was really intrigued by the Arctic region. And uh, I said, well, before starting this bureau, why not make one last expedition and then go to work? And um, uh, that was a really special expedition to the uh, magnetic North Pole position of 96. And uh, it was a very innovative uh, project because what we try to do is use specially developed mountain bikes on the way to the magnetic North Pole. And to be honest, I, I should have listened a bit more to the local population, the Inuit, because th they were making fun of me when we were unpacking these bikes. And uh, one of the guys even asked, why don't you bring uh, a phone boot? It's going to be as much use as your mountain bike. And he was right. <laughs> it wasn't uh, the best uh, strategy. Uh, it was a rather painful experience, as the guys in the audience can actually imagine quite easily. But um, I was rather fascinated uh, uh, by seeing, for example, uh, the older remains of Inuit life uh, in the region. Uh, this is a picture of whale bones uh, standing up together in a primary structure for a winter housing once covered by animal and deer skins. And uh, people live there for the entire winter, which is very dark and very cold, just to travel further as nomads. Uh, in, the, in the spring. These were whale hunting people living there hundreds of years ago with hardly any means of survival. No GPS's, no high-tech sleeping bags as we have today and they managed. So that's uh, really impressive. And things have changed of course in the, in the course of 500 years. So if you go to an Arctic community like I did then, you can see normal houses, buildings, uh, you can still see that these people are hunting and there's uh, this polar bear skin hanging out and when I saw it, I had a so, sort of moral judgment on this. I couldn't understand why, because there is a supermarket in this town, which is Resolute Bay <coughs> in Canada. And I actually asked one of the hunters, why do you still do that? Is, is it necessary? And uh, he asked me, how do you mean necessary? This is who we are. We've been hunting forever, and um, that's part of our lives. And, uh, and he explained to me that they, of course, respect nature. They will never overhunt the population. And uh, he invited me actually to join one of his polar bear hunting trips to be a witness to that. And uh, I joined him, which was challenging, um, a bit double feeling. But uh, and I went here with uh, Simon and uh, he was out from Resolute Bay within 30 minutes <laughs> driving his snow scooter. He got hold of a track and actually he did find a big male polar bear, the one he was allowed to shoot. And uh, you can see this uh, tiny spot on the horizon. Trust me, it's a huge male polar bear. But he's not quite sure if he can shoot it because, of course, he can shoot it, 
but he's not actually sure if he can retrieve it because the ice between us is quite young. Uh, this crack was very fresh, it was refreezing, the ice was only a day or two old and uh, then you get this really fresh ice called Nilas. So the guy walks away from the skidoo with his metal spear testing the sea ice conditions here and he sort of uh, looks back to me and he's a li bit, little bit uh, worried about me following the guy. He said, well, Mark, you really have to look out here. This ice is strong enough to walk, but you can't stand still. Because if you stand still, you will actually sink through. And, uh, well, actually, he did test the ice. It wasn't strong enough for the skidoo, luckily. So he didn't shoot the polar bear and let it go. So that was my first, let's say, encounter with uh, a polar bear. Um, first encounter with Nilas. I crossed it many times during my Arctic expeditions. Thousands of times, I might say. And sometimes it's really thin and you can actually see that when you're skiing on it on your skis. It moves away ahead of you, like uh, in a wave. And if that happens, you know, it's, it's quite thin. And uh, it's uh, important to keep the speed up a little bit. Um, well, let me take you in some pictures to this uh, unique environment. The North Pole region, uh, the geographic North Pole is in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Normally, the Inuit, for example, the, the local people won't go there because it's not very interesting to them. The coastlines are much more alive. There's much more seals and polar bears in the region. But this is how we went. Not even 800 kilometers from the Canadian coast to the geographic North Pole. Well, and this is sort of what you should have in mind if you look to the Arctic Ocean. It's a very deep ocean at some points. It can be up to 4,000 meters deep. There is some frozen seawater on top of that, which varies from a few centimeter, nilas, to a few meters if it's multi-year. But actually, it's relatively thin. And this thin layer of ice is very sensitive to wind. It can be pushed away by winds. It can be pushed away by sea currents. And um, yeah, that you should keep in mind because it's a very fragile top layer covering the ocean. I sometimes do compare it to fresh um, juice from uh, oranges. If you squeeze out your fresh oranges and you have the juice in a big bowl, you have the model of the Arctic Ocean basically, because the, the, the tiny bits from the, from, the, from the orange are covering uh, the surface, then you have the juice below that, and if you blow on this uh, bowl, you will see that all the tiny particles will start to move and uh, reform again, and that's exactly happening to the Arctic Ocean. It's always in motion, always. So that means you're crossing thousands of cracks on your way to the North Pole. You're sometimes stopped in very dynamic and a little bit dangerous terrain. You're operating at temperatures sometimes close to minus 40. You don't want to go for an involuntary swim. So sometimes the North Pole teaches you to be patient and camp out and see what the deformation of the ice is doing, perhaps it's pushed together, perhaps it refreezes, and uh, sometimes it compresses as well. Uh, so you get into, for example, here at the north coast of Canada in shear zone, really difficult compression regions where speed can go as low as 700 meters an hour. And then you're still working your ass off. But just to give you a clue of how that works, how slow you, you travel actually, some footage from last year I was guiding a team of eight people towards the geographic North Pole and you get a first glimpse of how that works. There's sound to it. March 30, we departed with a team of eight people to the Arctic Ocean to ski from the last degree to the geographic North Pole, which equals a distance roughly of 110 kilometers. This is Barneo Polo Base, temporary base operated by the Russians. Introduced here with the, one of the planes. And, and, and the first kilometers, we were actually quite lucky to find some good terrain, but you know, it's unavoidable that at some point you meet pressure ridges which you have to cross. that's enough for a first impression but you actually see that sometimes we're skiing but mostly we're crawling and trying to get away through this uh, enormous pack ice. Um, 
And then, of course, you meet these leads, which you can sometimes cross when floating in one of your sleds, for example. Um, that's a picture from uh, 97. But do compare to a picture made in the same region, exactly the same region, actually, around the same date, only seven years later, not so far ahead in history, you can see that things have changed. What you actually see is that the freeboard of sea ice has changed. It's not as thick anymore. That's the amount of sea ice sticking above the waterline. Uh, so the total thickness has changed. We uh, encounter these cracks much more often and quite early in the season as well. And of course, we're trying to change our strategy. We're bringing swimsuits, dry suits actually, so we can swim across open leads. I don't like it too much. If there is time left, I will show you a short video on the procedure. Quite interesting. Uh, this is uh, 2010, and we did encounter even thinner ice, but to be honest, in a mix. This is very young, single year sea ice, very thin. I expect it to be uh, as thin as 40 centimeters. Uh, it should have been 1.6 on average, uh, compared to a few years ago. The same year, we also did encounter multi-year sea ice, which was uh, meters thick. Uh, 2.6 meters uh, mostly. We did do some drilling uh, to actually really know what the sea ice thickness is. It's an absolute meaningless exercise actually because um, you drill at a certain location at a certain time which doesn't tell you anything about the, the state of the Arctic. Uh, don't get too excited over it but you can um, use it as a reference to satellite observation and that's what we do. I'm uh, uh, supporting the work of Cryosat, which is a European Space Agency satellite. It's now active for one year, and it has very precise altimeters on board. And far from space, it's actually measuring how thick the ice caps are, the Greenland ice cap, the Antarctic ice cap. But it can also see centimeter precise how far sea ice is sticking out above the waterline. And from that, you can derive total sea ice thickness, which is very important because we all know that the sea ice extent is changing what, what happens to the overall thickness uh, and, the, and the distribution of that that's very interesting this mission will be on for a few years and actually th this spring there will be a lot of field campaigns in the arctic gathering more data that can be compared to the satellites observation um, so to give you a view of how the arctic ocean behaves uh, the sea ice cover in surface changes per season. You can imagine that in winter time when it's really co cold and dark that the overall expand is much larger than springtime moves in and sea ice is disappearing at the edges at a higher rate than it is formed by the temperatures. So you get a sea ice loss towards a certain minimum. At the end of summer, let's say September, you have a sea ice minimum. And if you look at the minimum per year, you can see this clear trend. This is the sea ice minimum at the end of summer 79, and this is 2005. So you can actually see this decline, which is a clear trend over the last decades. S then 2007 came, and I use a slightly different graphic for that. This is a picture from the European Space Agency, but you can see that there is a big, big chunk sort of eaten away from the, let's say, Alaska Russian side, and towards Greenland you have some left, the Canadian basin as well but a large area disappeared, 1.3 million square kilometers, which was not anticipated, anticipated by any scientist. So I would just want to illustrate that change has high variability and is very difficult to uh, give a prognosis on where this is going. But the trend is clear. Eh? The trend is indeed saying that sea ice in extent is getting less and less. So, and that poses the question, this is the orange uh, circle pointing out the, the sea ice minimum in 2007. There seems to be some recovery in how many square kilometers are left, but not if it comes to thickness. You can see also a trend if you analyze the, uh, let's say, the age of sea ice in the Arctic basin. You can see that it's getting younger and younger. You can see uh, that the green older ice is uh, actually getting less and less. Um, so this poses the question, uh, where is this going? We're uh, moving towards the state of the Arctic Ocean where it gets uh, summer, uh, let's say, sea ice cover, which is present in winter, but perhaps absent in summer. And when will this happen? In 10 years, in 
20 years and 40 years. You hear different stories about it, but actually, in reality, no one knows exactly when the North Pole will be ice-free in summertime. Okay? So, um, we're still, you know, there's a lot of research going into this question, but no one knows for sure. But it's not going to last very long. It no, will not happen in just a few years, but it's actually on a downwards trend. That's true for sea ice, but on, also on land ice, you can see the differences quite well, actually. If you look to the Greenland ice cap, look, for example, to Lulisat on the, on the west coast. I've just been there, actually. This picture is also very young. You can see this nice village and these huge icebergs breaking off from uh, the Jakobs Jakobshaven uh, glacier in the Kangia Fjord. And this glacier produces enough icebergs and so fresh water, actually high quality fresh water, to serve a country as, as Belgium, for example, with all the water they need for their population and industry. So that's, that's discharged by a single glacier in Greenland. And you can see if you look to the glacier front of the this glacier that it's receding very fast and you can also see that the speed has doubled in recent years and the, uh, and the front of the glacier is moving with let's say uh, 20 meters, 22 meters per day and uh, that's quite fast. And you can so see also through years that change is never linear in this uh, system, it really goes rapidly. Kangaloo Sebek also have been there just recently, this is the edge of the Russell Glacier retreating a little bit but especially thinning. That, it's some, that is something we see overall in the margins of Greenland. The ice cap is thinning, getting lower at the edges. This imposes a few challenges. Some of our people were traveling there. This is my colleague, Philip Duro, who uh, encountered some meltwater last year, uh, one month ahead of schedule, actually. That led to some evacuations of other expeditions in the area, and that changed the whole, uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, possibilities of expeditions of crossing the ice cap from east to west. So more of Greenland, what is happening to the mass balance? Is this uh, land mass uh, actually losing a lot of ice or is it actually gaining because of more snow in the interior? That's been debated over the years, highly relevant because there is a potential of Greenland adding seven meters to sea level rise in the course of hundreds and hundreds of years, of course, but the potential is there. And if you look to all the research, indeed it is true that only a few years ago, uh, just to illustrate, you could argue if the Greenland ice cap was actually gaining mass through more snowfall or if it was losing mass because of the melting and the calving. Actually by now, if you look at all the types of research done, also here in Utrecht University, you can see that it's more and more clear that it's losing enormous amount of ice at this stage, between 130 and 250 gigatons per year. So there is uncertainty in science, you see the bandwidth, but we do know it's losing enormous amounts of ice already, adding much more to sea level rise than people anticipate in the official IPCC reports up to now. So what are the local impacts? We have some local impacts with the local communities, for example, in Alaska. They have difficulties doing whale hunts. Uh, this is their tradition, and we always have difficulties accept accepting this. We like to portray, in my opinion, these people very often as the victims of climate change, but we hardly sort of have the guts to see them as a whole human being and actually live with the fact that they are hunters, uh, in this case even for subsistence, uh, like the people in Canada, uh, hunters of seal, hunters of polar bears, they are confronted with change. Uh, but it's not only negative, they're not victims, they're, they're facing a new future in which they are challenged to stick with their traditional lifestyles, but they're also welcoming the fact that supply ships are coming more often and easier into the harbors, so they have fresh, uh, fresh uh, veggies year-round, which is an advantage, and they have the prospect of exploiting the Arctic as well, which raises enormous questions on how to do that. This is a, a magazine, in-flight magazine from Air Greenland, discussing the things that happened with a, a Scottish uh, oil and gas company operating in the south of Greenland looking for oil and gas. Well, and that's happening. I mean, there is new possibilities coming from this change and how do we deal with it? That will be one of the main questions for the Arctic in the future. And also that's the reason, exactly the reason why, for example, the Russians had a 
very sophisticated submarine going to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, exactly under the geographic North Pole, to point the flag. We're not having cold wars yet. There is, an, uh, let's say, United Nations Convention's Law of the Sea framework in which we can sort of try to steer these developments and, and uh, expanding claims to the Arctic. But this will be the main hot topic for the future, how we deal with it. And just to give you a brief, very brief outlook to my next mission, I will be back on the sea ice to look into the dynamics of how sea ice is behaving, how it is disappearing. There is some new development where the main loss of sea ice was always through the Fram Strait, as depicted here. But there is, let's say, a new leak here in this very narrow sea strait, in the Naris Strait between Canada and Greenland. I'll be going up there with a, a few colleagues next year because in 2007, 10% of the sea ice was lost only through that very narrow passage because normally you have natural bridges that um, sort of lock this with a plug and prevent the ice from moving away, these ice bridges, and they either don't form at all or they give way and that will change the dynamics. And just to give you a clue of how that looks, this is a 2007 event. You can actually see how fast things are moving within a few weeks. So imagine camping there out with your friends in a tent and hell breaks loose. So you can actually see this uh, thing is moving by tens of kilometers per day, actually. And uh, you don't want to be there uh, when it happens. So actually when we have our next mission between Canada and Greenland, where we will dr drill, a drill for sea ice thickness, we'll make special instrument readings, we'll put out some instrumentation as well, uh, weather stations that will follow this uh, movement and also will uh, record the atmospheric conditions under which it happens. We really have to time very well because if we have the wrong timing, we might be flushed out to the south of um, Canada or Greenland. We don't even know. And swimming may be a serious part of that expedition. So uh, this is our route for next year, challenging as it is, especially because we'll be uh, timing our mission carefully, making lots of sea ice thickness drillings, using this uh, electromagnetic profiler, which is tested right now by Christian Haas, who is a scientific partner in this mission, and will deploy a few of these weather stations, which are improved right now in Delft University. We're making new models, extra light, with a long life range, and they can uh, go there for months. And just to give you a last, very last taste of the expedition, one of the things I hate to do, but I'm afraid I'll have to do it next year a lot, the swimming on the North Pole. So Peter, what's happening? We uh, came to this uh, lead here and uh, we can't cross it with skis on, so this is our first time trying to get over with the help of the dry suits. So I am a test dummy and goes first. That's my Norwegian friend. Better Nick, he's always good better. This is the most difficult part, it's not open water, you cannot ski on it, it's flesh nor fish, so you will have to actually actively crush it to get through. This is now the dog safety in the Glovik, and uh, this is not precisely that in the expedition where it not echt naar uitkijkt, but it moet toch gebeuren, lijkt erop. Gaat wel heel moeizaam hoor. Spannend. You can see why I'm the guy holding the camera. Yeah? <laughs> okay, enough time spent. I'm not going to steal away more time from the speakers, but I'm looking forward to go into the Arctic region again to actually try to help understand what the dynamics are, what the outlook for the Arctic is, where we can find perhaps places where species like the polar bear have a chance to keep their habitat and actually work with, for example, WWF on defining these areas as a protected area. That is one of the ambitions I have as well personally, one of the things on my agenda for the future, and thanks for your attention. Thanks.